Okay, lads, today we're going to be taking a look at the Barbarian's Fundamentals, how to stay alive, how to do damage, and just generally how the class works and how you want to gear it out and what to look for and all of that good stuff. And I want to start by taking a look at the weapons expertise technique and the arsenal system, which is the class-specific mechanics for the Barbarian. And we can bring up the expertise panel by pressing Shift C in game. And here you'll see a list of all of those, one for each weapon type. And you'll notice straight away, they all have a rank that goes up to 10. And if you click on any one of these, we'll use the one-handed mace expertise for this example. You can see that there is a bonus you'll receive when you use this weapon for a skill. So this one gives you a 10% increased damage to stun enemies, but double that amount when you're using two one-handed maces. And just as a quick pro tip, you can actually make use of two expertise at once. If you're using dual wield, you could use the one-handed sword expertise or the one-handed mace expertise. But as the tool tip says, you actually double the amount of the specific one that you might be using if you have two of that particular weapon type. So something to bear in mind when you're making your weapon selection. Now, when you hit rank 10 on these, and again, you level them up just by using them, killing enemies with a skill that has this weapon selected, you'll get an additional bonus. And again, for the one-handed mace, you'll get an up to 10% chance to gain berserking for 1.5 seconds when you hit a stunned enemy. And like with the previous bonus, it's doubled if you are using two one-handed maces. Now, in addition to the expertise, we also have the technique slot. And this is unlocked at level 15 after completing the class quest chain. And the technique slot is something I think a lot of people still get very confused about. I want you to think of this as a completely separate independent buff and it's baseline, right? It's something that's always on regardless of anything else that you do with the rest of your character setup. So yes, you can stack them. You can have a two-handed axe technique while also using a two-handed axe for your main damage abilities. You can also have pole arm while using an axe or any combination that you can think of they're not connected so the technique is an independent buff so pick the one that sounds right for you in most cases it's almost always the two-handed axe anyways and then finally how do you select which weapons you're attacking with well if you press s in game it will bring up a skill menu here and you can hover over each of the skills that you have equipped and you can see here through the arsenal selection what weapons you can actually use for that particular attack. Now you may want to use something like a dual wheel weapon for just purely the attack speed but of course you'll be making use of the expertise for this attack with those weapon types. So you want to think carefully about what you want to use. Most build guides will make recommendations for you so you may not need to worry about that too much. Some attacks actually have a very specific weapon they can use. For example, Hammer of the Ancients will only work with a dual wield bludgeoning weapon, so you don't really have a choice there. And others have limited choices, like for example, Upheaval, which can only use two-handed weapons, either slashing or bludgeoning. And the arsenal system is really it's one of the coolest things about the Barbarian. It allows for a lot of versatility. It allows for a lot of customization of your character, how it plays. You can fill in weak spots your build currently has. And it's something I highly recommend experimenting with, getting used to, because it can be something that really helps your leveling experience. Because a lot of endgame builds assume you have everything in order, like you have all the right gear, which is not always the case. And some of these expertise may, may not be the like most optimal at the end game, but certainly while you're leveling, they may just get what you need to get your build up and running. So do take an opportunity to actually play around with these. Now, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about damage. Yes, how to hit big numbers. And I think the first thing to understand is that there are two different damage types, multiplicative and additive. And if you're to distill the difference down to the purest form, multiplicative is much more potent very, very valuable. You want to be getting as many of these that are relevant to your build as humanly possible. And an example would be here on my mace, I have Ancestral Force, which gives me 30% multiplicative damage increased to my Hammer of Ancients. And it's here, you can see the symbol of a little X after 30%. This is how I know this is multiplicative. And because I'm playing Hota, this is obviously very, very good for me. You're not just going to take every type of this damage source because some of it's going to be completely irrelevant to your build. But if you know that it's going to be good or if you're following a build guide, it should show you all of the multiplier buckets you're going to be targeting. And then there is additive. And 
when it comes to the, how this one works, there's actually videos out there that really go into the detail and spend like a good five, 10 minutes on the topic. But to keep it nice and simple, Additive damage sources have a much, much steeper diminishing return than multiplicative. So when you have too many, lots and lots and lots of them, they just become less and less valuable over time. However, they are still your main source of damage increase. So absolutely do still pay attention to these. But basically, it just means that these types of damage are going to be slightly less important than multiplicative ones, especially when you're comparing things like aspects. But fear not, there are some really nice and easy ways to get some multiplicative damage with little to no effort. For example, critical hit damage, you get a baseline inherent 50% damage increase, which is multiplicative. And you don't even need any of the stat on your gear to actually access this. As long as you're doing critical strikes, then you will get that nice little juicy damage bonus. And this is something you can start very early on by getting some crit chance on your gloves or on your rings. Or perhaps you can get some increased crit chance through something like an aspect or a passive as well. Next is overpower and every class has a 3% chance to overpower. So you can always kind of get a one or two of these in during a fight. However, there are plenty of ways to increase your frequency of overpowering. We have some skills like bash that will help you get some out. We also have aspects like earth strikers, which will get some out for you. And overpowers also hit for 50% extra damage multiplicatively without you having to have any of the actual stat in your gear. And then finally, we have vulnerable. Again, much like the other two, except from this one is 20%. And this is again, another really easy one to get access to early on. You could run pressure point from the skill tree, expose vulnerability, or in the Paragon board, you could run exploit. So there's a number of ways you can get this vulnerable damage up and running. And if you're able to tap into all three of these, you can get a quite nice and easy 120% increased damage just for infesting a couple of points here and there. However, with all three of these stats and actually with every other stat minus strength, which I will talk about in just a second, every other damage modified that you can get on a weapon is additive. So when it comes to picking one of these other modifiers, the basics on how to make that decision are pretty simple. You want to consider two things. How high is it numerically? You know, it might be additive. However, having a bigger number is still better. But you need to also compare that or weight it, should I say, against the condition that you need to meet in order to get that damage. So an example would be if you have 50% critical hit damage and you're comparing that against 50% damage to enemies that are close, then the clear winner here is close enemy damage because you can rely on that much more than you can rely on crit damage because a crit will be gated behind your crit chance. So if you have, say, extremely high crit at 50%, you're only going to be making use of that damage 50% of the time. Whereas close as a barbarian is probably more like 100% of the time. And that's really it. You just make your best judgment call on which one you think you're going to be making the most use of. And that is how you pick the additional stats on your gear. And I did say I was going to talk a little bit about strength. Now, strength is a pretty unique stat as our core stat. Not only is it a multiplicative damage source, it is also a source of armor. So it's extraordinarily valuable to have this. And you pretty much always want to have it on each of your weapons. All stat is a good alternative. Actually, in a lot of my builds, I use both all stat and strength to get the most possible strength I can on each of them. And yeah, it's, just, it's definitely something that you just want as a baseline on every type of your weapons. And earlier on in the game, when you're leveling up as well, you may even want some of it on your armor as well, just to help bring up not just your armor itself, but also your damage. However, there are some exceptions to this rule. And this comes down to some Paragon Glyphs that were introduced with Season 2, being Blood Rage and Hemorrhage. And what these do is they take a particular damage type. So for Blood Rage, it's damage while berserking. And Hemorrhage, it's vulnerable damage. And it will take a small amount of that total damage bonus you have from either one of those sources and create a new multiplicative damage bucket from it. One of the most powerful things to come out of the Barbarian in Season 2 is Blood Rage. It takes 25% off your Berserk damage bonus. And that is what becomes that separate multiplicative damage. And you are capable of getting nearly 400% damage while Berserking bonus, which will equal an additional 100% multiplicative damage increase. And you get both. So you're double dipping into these sources and these are extraordinarily powerful and present in pretty much any build that can work with them. 
So this is something you definitely want to consider as you get into the later game because these nodes are extremely good. Okay, so now we've talked about stats. What about item power, right? When does that come into play? How important is that? Well, it's really important for the weapon that you're attacking with, the one that you want to do damage with. So for me, you know, playing Hammer of the Ancients as an example, my two-handed bludgeoning weapon, the item power on that is extremely important because that number, that weapon DPS, is the foundation that all of your damage modifiers build up upon. So the higher that number is, the higher your damage is at the high end. So very, very important. You definitely want to pay a lot of attention to this. For your other weapons, not so much important. Probably, well, pretty much not important at all because you're not going to be using those to do damage. So when does that become more important than the stats? And this is a very hard thing to figure out without using like a damage calculator, which is very, very high end like theory crafting for a lot of people. So what I tend to do is a general rule of thumb is that if the weapon that I'm looking at that has higher item power has at least two of the stats that I need, as well as having at least 30% more weapon DPS, that is enough for me to upgrade to it. Anything less than that, I won't consider it. It's not worth the investment because it's probably very much likely over not an upgrade or maybe an upgrade of only a couple of percent. So I don't want to waste an aspect. I don't want to waste my gold, right? So if it can hit those two sort of goal posts, then I will upgrade to it. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about like DPS utility. So amulets are a great source of DPS because you can get passives on them. Now, every build will have kind of a preferred passive it wants to go for. Hota, you can use either wallop or heavy handed or even counter offensive. All of these give you really, really nice DPS boosts. Now, it's hard for me to say exactly which one you want to look at because again, each build will have one that it prefers. But this is definitely something you want to keep an eye out for because an amulet with a good passive on it is extremely high value, very, very hard to find. So keep your eyes peeled, know what you need ahead of time. And yeah, just don't let those slip through your fingers. And then finally, we have Fury Cost Reduction and Fury Generation. These are really important because they simply allow you to cast your abilities more often. Fury Cost Reduction just reduces the cost, like it says on the tin. And then Regen, what that does is it increases the amount of Fury you get from anything that you do that gives you Fury. So things like your basic attacks, uh, things like an aspect of Unrelenting Fury that refunds some of the Fury that you use from an attack, Echoing Fury, you know, Berserk Fury, whatever it is, it boosts the potency of those up making them work a lot more better so you definitely want to be trying to get these where you can and as to where to find them fury cost reduction is on boots and amulet and then fury regen is on rings and then finishing this section off we're just going to quickly touch on gloves now gloves are very simple because they're basically the same priority for every single build except from whirlwind because whirlwind doesn't use attack speed but other than that you want attack speed, critical hit chance, strength, and then ranks to your core skill. Ranks to your core skill are very, very powerful. These increase your damage by a ton. So you definitely want to be keeping an eye out for these. But again, the great thing about gloves is they're very straightforward and you don't need to know like a million different combinations. You just get attack speed, crit chance, strength, and then your core skill and you're done. And now we're going to be talking a little bit about defenses and how to make sure your character has enough survivability not to be one shot by everything that hits them. We're going to start by talking about armor. Armor reduces the amount of physical damage that you take, which is going to be the primary source of damage that you are getting hit by. Now, this does have a cap of 85%. But that cap has a handicap applied to it when the monsters are a higher level than you. And we'll get into that in just a second. But at level 100, it is 85%. Now, when it comes to getting armor, there are several sources of this. You get it as a baseline on your actual armor, as you'd expect. And this does actually scale with the item power. However, it's not a priority. I definitely wouldn't be picking pieces of gear based on their item power, you want to be paying closer attention to the affixes overall. Now, I want to distill this, and um, again, like with most things in this video, try and make it as easy as possible to understand, not to overburden you with the math. However, there are some excellent resources over on Mobilitics that I'll leave linked in the description if you want a full mega detailed breakdown on all of the math behind all of this kind of talk here. But 
for everybody else, when it comes to armor, essentially what you're going to be aiming to do is get to between 7,500 and about 8,500 armor on your stat sheet, like here in town where you can see on mine here, I have 8,065. And you want to have disobedience on your necklace. This will give you up to 100% extra armor um, once you've got to 60 stacks, which is pretty easy to do with most builds. And that should see you through quite easily to 13,500, which is the armor cap when doing a tier 100 nightmare dungeon. But again, if you want the full breakdown for the nitty gritty, the super specific, check the description down below. And then, so where are you gonna find all of this armor? Like I said, you get a lot of it from your gear itself. However, if you fall short of the requirements, you know, being between 7,500 and 8,500, some other places you can get it are as affixes on your gear. Like here on my chest piece, I have 26% total armor ready to go. Amulets can also run total armor as well. So that is another good place to try and find some. And finally, you have your Paragon board, which will have plenty of armor nodes for you to select from. You can get quite a bit from here. And so you need to make a combination of all of this in order to get to that cap, but it is really important that you do. Now, moving on from armor, the next thing you need to pay attention to is your resistances. And these take care of all of your non-physical damage types. So this is like fire, lightning, cold, everything like that. Now, these all have a cap of 70%. And that's what our goal is. That's what we're trying to get to. But one thing you need to bear in mind is as you move up the difficulty tiers, so as you go into World Tier 3 and World Tier 4, you're hit with a handicap. And in World Tier 4, that handicap is minus 50%. So you actually need about 120% total in order to stay capped in World Tier 4. And it is important that you do this because otherwise you are going to get absolutely melted by elites that are using like elemental damage types. But luckily for us, even as a strength class, this is still very, very easy to do. The generic thing that you can do is just have one resistance on each piece of armor. So one on your head, one on your chest, one on your pants, one on your boots, and then one in your rings by having two jewels of the same color. And that's it. Simple. That, that's literally resistance is capped. No problemo. However, not many builds run like that a lot of them have uniques and when you have a unique that armor slot will not have a resistance because none of the uniques do except from one but nobody uses it so we won't, we won't bother talking about that one but yes say for example you have a unique helmet well now you don't have the resistance that was there you need to put it somewhere else the easiest place to put an extra resistance is on your boots Boots have the most sort of open slots compared to others. So you can definitely whack one on there without there being little to any interruption to your build whatsoever. However, it gets more complicated when you're running say two uniques because now you have two displaced resistances. How are you gonna take care of that next one? Now you can just simply put another one on the boots. I mean, you can put up to four on the boots and that pretty much solves all the problems. However, you don't always want to throw away that movement speed. And with certain builds, the fury cost reduction is an absolute must. So what you want to consider here is clever use of your jewelry. By having two gems of one type, you can pretty much cap out an entire resistance. And then you can use one jewel of another type in combination with your Paragon board to cap out another. So you can see I actually have cold resistance nodes in my Paragon board in combination with one cold resistance gem and this will do the job. It also helps to have rings that have an implicit resistance that you need as well. So you can see I have cold and fire resistance on my rings, which is exactly what I needed. It is hard to have exactly a perfect answer for this because a lot of it is determined by the gear that you get. You know, did you have shadow or fire resistance on your chest? You know, for example, or you know, it was poison on your boots. You'd have to interchange where they are based on the gear that you're given. But as long as you have one of each type in any of the places that I've just spoken about, you'll be absolutely fine. So now that we've got armor and we've got resistance out of the way, what's the next stat that we want to be paying attention to? For me, it absolutely is max HP. Max HP is the king of DR as far as I'm concerned. And you want to be stacking as much of this as humanly possible. There's no greater deeper meaning to it just having more hp literally makes you more tanky and also you know it just looks good right to have tons of hp and the places in which you're going to try and get this are the helmet the chest and your pants you're going to also try and get it on both of your rings i really recommend that you do get it on both of your rings because you can get up to 1.3k per ring 
Then you're going to use rubies in all of your gear. And of course, you have things like the Paragon board, which will also have a lot of sources of maximum life for you to hit. I would say it's a level 100 being under 16k is on the very low side. I would aim to be somewhere around 17 to 18k with good gear, 19 plus with great gear. And then finally, what do we do with the last modifier on our gear? Well, funny enough, this is a lot like how you select your weapon modifiers or your DPS modifiers. You want to be paying very close attention to what has the highest numerical value and what is the least conditional damage reduction type. So I'm talking damage reduction from closes of our brain, very reliable. Flat damage reduction, perfect, right? You can't really get much better than that. However, it does roll pretty low. So sometimes, you know, if you're comparing 7% damage reduction versus 20% damage reduction from close, well, then maybe the scale is still tipping towards close. You have distant, you have from enemies that are bleeding, so on and so forth. And depending on your build, some of these are going to be more valuable than others. So again, just use your best judgment, which has the most value and also the easiest condition to meet. And then finally, when it comes to survivability, there's sort of two utilities that I want to talk about. Cooldown reduction. Firstly, this actually I was going to talk about in the damage section, but it kind of it, it captures everything. So it's a bit of everything. But what this does is it just makes your class powerful in every respect. Being able to press your buttons more often just means everything is more powerful. Your defensives, your offensives, everything is working more smoothly. The class is fun to play this way. It's something that you absolutely want to take everywhere that you can find it. So on your helmet, and on your amulet where it can roll you want to check your paragon board make sure you're not missing anything there aspects and stuff like that cooldown reduction is probably the most powerful stat in the game so make sure again you're keeping an eye out for it and locking down as much of this as humanly possible and then finally you have movement speed i think this is a utility a lot of people sleep on but i am a big movement speed enjoyer it rolls on boots and it rolls on amulets so i wouldn't roll it on an amulet there are much more important stats to get there but definitely on boots not only does movement speed get you from point a to b quicker which is the whole point of a lot of builds in this game is just doing things as fast as possible but it also gives you a bit more leeway for getting out of things like CC circles or poison pools, anything that you can think of that you need to get out of. Movement speed will help a lot there. Not only can you get it on boots, as I mentioned, you can actually get it through your skill tree as a barbarian. We have the swiftness passive, which gives us a nice little healthy dose of it there. And then there are some paragon nodes as well that will help you get some when you kill an elite in the hunter killer node. And finally, when you're berserking, which is a very powerful tool this season, you'll also get a 15% movement speed here as well, which is really nice. So it's not hard to get up to like 150, maybe even 170% movement speed as above. And you'd be whizzing around like an absolute lunatic. But that's it. That's kind of the quick 101. Answers a lot of questions I get asked all the time on stream. I hope it was helpful. Let me know if it was. If you have any specific questions maybe that I missed out, don't forget to let me know down in the comments. I'll do my best to get around to them. But yeah, if, um, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to give it a like, subscribe to the channel for more Diablo content and check out the live stream live on Twitch every single day. Link down in the description below. But uh, thanks for watching. Catch you on the next one.